navigate our way through the city's bureaucracy to get the appropriate permissions, um, approvals, and funding for the Tortilla Flats mural projects, which started 26 years ago, more than a quarter of a century, and we're still at it. Some things are too good to go away. Denise was a patron to many art projects, and she was a patron saint to Gavin, who we are honoring tonight. Another panelist, Phil Taggart, I have known the longest because both, both of us were longtime Ventura Avenue residents. Before I found out about the full range of his talents, I knew that he had a great interest in documenting grassroots efforts around Ventura, and I liked him immediately for that. Aside from filming and documenting many or most of the art projects around town, he was actually boosting, supporting, and preserving many worthy and deserving projects. His own personal archives must be amazing. His effort as a writer poet has essentially kept Ventura's poetry scene alive for years. Much of the same could be said about Steve Aguilar. Despite knowing him for a very long time, I am still discovering his many talents. Many years ago, we were organizing a fundraiser with some bands and we needed a sound system. Someone said, call Steve Aguilar. We did and he delivered. So that's what I thought he did. He was the sound guy. <laughs> Later, I found out that he is an accomplished performer as a singer and guitarist. Then I realized he was filming events too. And even later, I saw some amazing short films that he had written, directed, and performed in. I have seen a number of them, but I'm always overjoyed when I discover yet another one on YouTube. The reason that we have so much footage of Gavin performing is because of the efforts of Phil Taggart and Steve Aguilar. I am so grateful that in my life I have been blessed to cross paths with Denise, Phil, and Steve, and of course, Gavin. And I, I can't think of people who would be better equipped to tell the story of Gavin and the impact he made on this, on, on our community. So like, just like that, uh, David, I'd like to uh, see where you want to go. Okay. Well, thank you. And then we also have um, Chris Jensen here. Uh, Chris, did you want to introduce yourself real quick? Yeah. Hi, I'm Chris. I know most of you. Well, I know half of you anyway. And uh, I'm just a big fan. So um, Maribel invited me to join this and I didn't really hesitate other than I'm kind of shy. So um, hello, everybody. <laughs> well, so I, I thought what we could do is just kind of start with um, a slideshow and go through some of his work for those of us. Um, and I'm one of those people that was not very familiar with Gavin. Um, and, and I'm just learning about it. So um, I really had the pleasure of actually putting this show together and really have started to see through the, both the tool, tool Room Gallery exhibit as well as the work that's being shared on photos, just the power of his work and um, Phil, like, um, the poems that you have are really powerful as well. So I'd like to start um, with uh, Denise here who um, is with the Ventura Museum and as Moses said is very instrumental, um, has been very instrumental in the um, Ventura arts community both in her work with the city and now with the museum. So um, Denise did you want to introduce yourself real quick and kind of share your, your, your how you first met Gavin and some of the stories behind his work? Uh, I'd love to. Um, I am working for the museum. I'm the deputy director. I started there in 2017 after a long stint, as Moses said, at the city of Ventura, working in both cultural affairs and community partnerships. Gavin and I met and I was trying to de decide whether it was 1993, 94, I'm a little fuzzy on the dates, but I was working for the venerable Ventura bookstore uh, in downtown Ventura on Main Street and um, 
a young man walked in smoking a cigarette and I was the very harsh bookstore clerk who had to um, usher him out and tell him he couldn't smoke in the store. So that was our auspicious first meeting. And uh, he, he was not very happy with me at that first meeting, but uh, a relationship grew over the many years that we um, grew to be very close friends. Uh, he I was able to listen to his poetry. Uh, my former bosses, Kent Weigel and Ed Elrod, often hosted author talks or poetry readings in the Oddfellows Lodge upstairs from the Ventura bookstore. And uh, Gavin did a reading there and it was just transformative. And uh, we lost track of one another for a couple of years. And then when he started working for Turning Point Foundation, uh, and Chris, you'll remember this, we, um, back in 1996, I think, my former business partner and I had a um, program where we worked with Turning Point clients to do a holiday um, event. Chris, you photographed the clients, I believe. We provided holiday clothes. And Gavin, at that time, was the case manager that I was connected with. And um, that all transpired in the upstairs gallery. And then kind of the rest is history. So you're seeing some works in the slideshow that are from my personal collection. I have many others. Uh, the one that David's showing right now is a very specific piece that uh, documents the shooting of a young uh, black boy in a uh, restaurant parking lot by an off-duty police officer. So this piece was probably created 20, 25 years ago. So um, as relevant then as it is today. And then I'll let the next, and uh, not waving but drowning is a piece. Gavin was incredibly uh, well read and um, was not a poet who only read his own work. Uh, this is based on a poem by British author uh, and poet Evie Smith. Um, so his references in his poetry and in his artwork um, speak to his love of the written word of the recorded music, Gavin sang, he performed, he read, and he produced prolifically um, incredible works of art that um, number in the hundreds, if not thousands. And then I'll okay. turn it over to who wants to talk. Okay. About. Well, then this one here looks like it's a uh, kind of a satire of rent on the avenue. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. And so Gavin moved up and down uh, Ventura Avenue. Uh, had many, for somebody I was saying earlier, for somebody who had um, moved so often, had so much accumulated stuff. And this was part of a, an exhibit that Phil put together with the Artist Union and uh, Monopoly money, uh, avenue imagery, um, you know, figured prominently in Gavin's work. Thank you, Denise. You're welcome. So, Steve, um, did you want to share a few words on uh, how you first came across Gavin, how you met him, and um, then we'll kind of scan through some of the works here. I'll, I'll kind of scan through them as we go. And then if there's any one particular ones you want to stop through or go back on, just let me know. Um, so Steve, please go ahead. Um, okay. Um, the first time I met Mr. Gavin, uh, I went to a party over at Eunice Kingsley house, which uh, Kingsley's house, uh, who was another fine poet in the area. And um, we just met and uh, pretty much started arguing right then and there. And <laughs> we just continued on through uh, all the years. And uh, we became friends uh, because, um, like Moses said, um, I was also a performer. And so we admired each other's uh, poetry. And um, I guess um, the spontaneity of him is what really made him uh, interesting. Uh, that one on the left is the Highway 33 um, Avenue. Uh, that's another avenue thing. And um, 
So that's what I liked. Um, like Denise said, he was very well read and uh, very articulate. Uh, and he can cover vast subjects in a small amounts of time. Uh, that's what I enjoyed about him. He just came over and usually had a bicycle that he had just acquired. And uh, oh, over on the left, that is uh, Michael. Uh, that was uh, his uh, boyfriend uh, for many years uh, who he really liked. And on the right, that is Michael Jackson. And that's part of the stuff that lives here. And uh, what else about Mr. Gavin? Oh, he said he liked to use the number two pencil to draw uh, because uh, that's what they gave him in school. And uh, like I said, he was articulate and spontaneous. Uh, he had troubles in his life, but that really didn't matter to me or to him. Uh, because I guess that's another thing. We just kind of accept each other as we were and didn't really look too deep. And um, I have plenty of films on him. Um, uh, that is also Michael and uh, Gavin right there. Um, Mr. Gavin was a very, I guess, creative and sad man. And... Um, and I think he was very gifted at being able to just splash that across a, a stage or a, a piece of canvas. Um, and I think that's what his real gift was, is um, knowing how to feel life and then knowing how to express it uh, in some art form to share it with the world. Um, he once, uh, in an interview, uh, told me that uh, uh, it was difficult, and uh, it was not only difficult to have lived the experience, but, th but then to put it out on a screen where everybody can see it. And, uh, and if he did it correctly, uh, that, that was one of his greatest joys. And, uh, and like Denise said, he moved a lot. I would like to put a brag out there I never moved Mr. Gavin <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my things and uh, he just float by come in yell out some poetry and and uh, we just uh, interact and have a good time um, he was a very good friend um, we also used to say that uh, he was uh, we were born into two halves that we were really the same person and mm -hmm. that um and the two halves were fortunate uh, in this life to uh, come out and hang out a little bit. So that's what I have to say about Mr. Gavin, and I miss him. Thank you, Steve. How many um, how many works do you have of his? Oh, well, as I can count, I got about sixteen of them. Okay. Uh, uh, full pieces, and then you know I also have. Um, a bunch of the stuff that he made art with. I have collections of uh, religious icons and uh, small pieces of this and that. And then uh, some materials that uh, were in pieces that left pieces and are in transitional pieces or not transitional anymore um, that I have with me. Uh, just, just things that he used to use to create art. On oh, one time, we're supposed, oh, this is just my story here. We we're supposed to create an art piece together. And so I made this nice angel on this four by eight sheet. And uh, it said a war and it said got war on it someplace, I think right on the hat. And I said, okay, Mr. Gavin, here's the piece I made. Why don't you add to it? And I came over not too long later and I says, Mr. Gavin, where, where's the piece that, I, that we're supposed to work on? And he had completely painted it over and he says, it's right there behind mine. <laughs> <laughs> and that is just Mr. Gavin. He went he went into my bathroom one time and painted something on the wall. And it lived there forever. Yeah. <laughs> so that's Mr. Gavin. There was no slowing him down. No. Uh, and there was no bottling him and there was no controlling him. Uh he was a, com a complete expression at all times. And that's him. Okay. Thanks. I think I ran out of stories. No, no, that's all right. Thank you very much. No, it's all right, great. You're welcome. Um, and so next, I want to introduce Phil here. And before Phil, before um, 
say a few words. What I wanted to share was also one of the things I'm learning is uh, really about Gavin's poetry here. So I wanted to share a clip that um, Phil has, and Phil has actually quite a few, and we'll get those up on the website and um, kind of highlight them a little bit more here. But let me. This ain't the freedom we were singing about, this one that we got. We walked around singing, sang in Mississippi on red dirt roads. In Detroit, we lifted up our voices on the west side, sang in step. I led the orphans in white half robes singing, Pass me now, oh gentle savior. On the hill, my brother and I, we harmonized on the corner to sweet harmony. And he got to sing in church, God cares, when I wanted him to so bad. We could rock a front porch when they were still singing in neighborhoods and not shooting. We could hold a corner down with the stylistics. My mama woman, she only sang in the kitchen. And it was always summertime. And the living is easy. But sometimes, and those times were deep times when she loved only porgy. Ours was a singing house. Though it were no sing-song life, we were singing all the time. Now, when my grandma sang, all things hushed to the voice that was weighed with depth. And I learned that in the song, each passage is a message that we were passing to our gods. So, Phil, do you want to share a few words about how you first met Galvin and the uh, some of the poetry and your experience recording him and working with him? Um, I met Galvin at the at Cathy Voltaire while he was still working for Turning Point, and he just showed up for a poetry reading. Uh, I'm not sure how he got there. I it could have been Denise. It could have been Steve. It could have been anyone. Or actually, there was another person that was part of the arcade poetry scene that may have sent him over. And he became a regular every week at uh, Cathy Voltaire and just about every reading and through uh, until he passed, he would show up just about every week. Sometimes he would just drive his bike by, but uh, he would, he kind of look in and drive back out. So, um, but I had known him for quite a while. It really was quite wonderful to work with him. Um, and uh, I, of course he was a bit temperamental so the piece you saw was actually shot at the Artist Union Gallery. Uh, and, but I also shot part of them at the studio in Oxnard. And I redid the other one because it was shot in SD and so I put HD on the picture so it looks better for the new one. Um, he was quite wonderful. I think he actually helped a lot of people, made it quite possible for a lot of people to continue with their performance. And I'm thinking of some of the younger people that are no longer younger people. And they would see him come in and they would actually try for performance. And, uh, and he, they would go up to him. This guy named Splash would go up and ask him, ask Gavin what he thought. And uh, uh, he was quite a center at that point. And uh, really lucky to have him. Uh, we were able to do some artist union shows. He did some artist union shows. I think it was the gallery on uh, the beach. He did a few shows there. Uh, he was, uh, we did some performance stuff. Gwendolyn Alley, we did a, a, a fundraiser for uh, when Gwendolyn Alley took him to the Taos Poetry Circus and I think it was in New Mexico. And uh, um, he actually took second place in the, uh, um, uh, the, the free, the open competition. And he would have probably taken first place, but he didn't really think much of the time limit. 
So he would not, he would not change the time limit. Uh, one of the things that was kind of interesting uh, about recently putting this video back together and putting it out, a lot of LA poets were very interested in him and they wanted to know where they could get books. So uh, he is still, you know, he is still, his work is still very, very of interest in uh, very many places. But uh, let's see, oh, and, and you can kind of see the, the church in, uh, um, in Govin's work. Well, Govin used to go to McCurtis's church on the avenue. And if you ever been to McCurtis's church in the old days when Michael was really kind of rocking it, uh, Michael McCurtis, Govin would actually get in there and try to preach occasionally. And he, and he was very friendly with the McCurtises and it was a really, a, he really enjoyed it. And so he would show up there. In fact, when his brother, uh, Brian showed up, uh, he was, we hung out for a few hours and I brought him to McCurtis's church because I figured God had been there. I didn't know it for sure. And so I brought him over there. Michael, Michael, uh, Michael McCurtis was talking about him. I think he called them the Gov and talked about him for quite a while and what it was like to have him in there. Uh, I can tell you a couple of stories. I'll tell you a uh, story. His first uh, Bell Arts experience, we were having a board meeting at Bell Arts in the big room there, and Govan had this three-wheel bike that he had for a while, and he opened up the front door and he rode the three-wheel bike all the way out through the, through through the, 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 the corridor there and then drove out the other side, kind of wanting to see what was going on. It was uh, typical Gavin, really kind of showing up and, and doing some really wonderful things. And we were very glad to have him there. Let's see, and a couple of, he was a very, he, he really accepted people pretty well. I mean, really being in Ventura, which is a pretty wide area. And uh, he accepted people. I remember one, a, an artist one time was, uh, was lecturing him on the black experience, which I just looked over at Gavin and he's, his eyes are getting wider. And finally <laughs> he rolled his eyes and smiled and kind of walked away. And, uh, but he was, you know, he, he would accept that. And, and I wrote down a couple of things here. One of, I think this was at uh, Denise's and Natalie's uh, thing when he was doing uh, women, uh, uh, women's singing groups and he was, very much he was dressed as Diana Ross that day and I asked him what what's up with Di what's up with Diana Ross and he told me he said at the time Diana Ross was in jail because she got that drunk driving thing going and she was in jail and he says and someone has to be her while she's in jail so uh he was he was quite a wonderful guy and yes he was very well read. We had some really wonderful conversations about the different poets that he read and also his art experience, although it does seem a bit primitive, he, he studied art. He was very much into studying art. He knew different styles. He could tell you, uh, he, could, he could look at other people's art and actually tell you what style they were coming from. Um, we were very lucky to have him in this area the time that we did. I know that uh, people came to see him and uh, people would, if he read, people would come from out of town to come see him, especially the Santa Barbara area, or uh, even we had people that would come up from Los Angeles to see him perform. So uh, I think that's it for me. <laughs> well, thank you. How many, how many poems would you say that he has that are, that are out there? Are there books or, or anything that, that uh, his work that, this is kind of the sad part about it is that Gavin did not, his stuff was handwritten and he didn't really type anything up. Uh, if he did, he didn't share that. Cause you could see at the end when he's doing his performance, he had liked to have them handwritten then he'd throw them out as he was doing his performance. Of course he always did gather them up at the end. <laughs> but yeah, he's, uh, that's a pretty sad thing. Like I said that uh, he could have sold books but he didn't want to go there. I know that we were able to, Marsha and I were able to um, publish one of his poems, but I think it was after he had passed because uh, we, we typed it up and put it in the skew. But he did not do that. And he'd been invited several times to be in Art Life, but he didn't want to do the multiple pages. So uh, it was unfortunate, but he was, he did not have anything. And from what I understand, 
his poetry is somewhere in Pittsburgh. So, but it sounds like you have a you have quite a bit of an archive there with uh, the videos that you've taken. Yeah, and I was able to do that, but I think actually Steve Aguilar is actually the king of archive. Okay. He's got a whole bunch of stuff. It's so far, it's I, I like to think it's probably in cartons under his bed, and he's <laughs> waiting to get them out there. And he's got a lot of performances of Gavin and pretty much uh, the whole art scene from the Insomniac on. He was quite a, uh, he, he quite, he, he did a lot. And a lot of Gavin's work is probably in a carton underneath Steve's bed until he gets it out. <laughs> I'm Steve. <laughs> it, it, it's true. As uh, a matter of fact, I have some old, uh, I have discs of Gavin's writing, uh, a bunch of them actually, uh, but they're old uh, PC discs. Mm. I'll, I'll have to get them in some kind of machine and look at them sometime. But yeah, I have a lot of stuff under the bed. Thanks would, for you would, the, would you say that he was more a, an artist or a poet or both, or did he flow back and forth? Or was he kind of, you know, you, you never knew what projects he was working on? Um, I would say that he flowed back and forth, but I don't think there was much difference between his painting and his poetry. Uh, mm -hmm. It was just a matter of the expression he was using. It was, it was still the same thing, I think. But yeah, he would float back and forth. And no, uh, to know what Mr. Goblin was, was doing would be, quite a feat of uh, dishonesty <laughs> because <laughs> Mr. Gobbin was doing Mr. Gobbin and, uh, and nobody quite knew what he was doing all the time but yeah he would uh, he could just he was just so it just came out of him for some reason um, like some people are endowed with mathematical whatever wizardry or philosophical wizardry or whatever this man was just endowed with expression mm -hmm. uh, and it started very young too he used to tell me that he just used to do it very young. And, uh, and it, it was difficult for him at times. He grew up poor in, uh, in the poor areas. And um, he'd seen a lot, been a lot, done a lot. Yeah, Mr. Gavin, uh, I'll have to dig out the stuff. Yeah, no, I, I think, uh, Moses, please. Uh, yeah, Steve, you know, um, I know that you also had some films of the late Native American poet John Trudeau because we brought him to town several times. And I'm noticing now that some some books are still being published um, uh, of John's work, all right? So even though that govin has gone now, a book could still be published. I mean, the material is there. I mean, that, that's the main thing in the book, you know, the material, and it's there. I mean, I don't know anything about permissions and all those types of things, but the job, it, it could be done. I think it's an excellent idea. Um, one of the, the things in my life that I, I don't approve of is that I didn't uh, bring out more of Mr. Govin's uh, art and expression since I have so much of it. And that uh, I didn't really bring it forth or, or that, that, like, that his stuff is not prominent out there anymore. And that some folks don't even know who Mr. Govin is, one of the most powerful artists that we've had here in, in Ventura. I mean, everybody is good. But Mr. Goblin was in a category all by himself. You know, he was exceptional. <clears throat> all the more reason for such a book, and especially nowadays when they're downloading books and, and I guess people could see the videos and hear the poems or read the poems. Technology is pretty amazing. Uh, this is amazing. <laughs> I've never seen it before. I've seen a commercial with all these little pictures. I was wondering what it was. Oh, no. It's the Zoom people. Yeah. <laughs> so, Denise, do you know if um, the city has any of Gavin's work in their uh, culture? No, that's actually a really kind of sad story. Um, the city, uh, Jackson Wheeler, uh, when he was on the um, Municipal Art Acquisition Committee, 
recommended to the committee um, to acquire works by Gobbin, but the powers that be, and I hate to say this because I was one of the staff people there, but the committee felt that Gobbin's work was non-archival and was not meritous of being included in the city collection. And um, as somebody who was a, a dear friend and a collector of his work, it was very tough for me. We, nor do we have works from him, from him in the museum collection. And I think it's, it's time to yeah. look at how we rectify that issue. And, um, you know, as we're sitting here talking, Phil and I were talking earlier about putting a call out to the greater community. I mean, Gobbin's work, he, just as Steve was saying, we all have works in our homes that we live with every day and we get to enjoy every day, but the public doesn't get to see this great, enormous body of work. And we have the ability to photograph these pieces and share these stories and share them with the public. So it sounds like we've got a project on our hands that maybe um, we're all uniquely qualified to work together on to make a reality. Um, Dobbins poetry, all of his handwritten poetry, went home to Pittsburgh with his brother in a suitcase um, back in 2012. And we're still in touch with Brian. And I think he would be interested in working with us on creating that archive. And um, so maybe that's, maybe we all have a job ahead of us. Yeah. I was, I was gonna say, uh, you know, when the Carnegie closed, Jackson Wheeler sent all of his Gavin stuff over to the Carnegie. And so that might be, you might be able to get that. Okay. Uh, I was gonna go back to a, a, um, a thing about, we were talking about the difference between his work. Gavin, when I was asking him about it, he said, he, it's, all, it's all prayer, it's all poeming. It, he felt they all fit together. And, uh, and of course, you know, he considered it prayer, but he also considered it, uh, his, his painting was the same as his poems. This is what he, this is what he told me. That's really interesting. You know, the, the, I think that speaks to the creative process and, you know, the, his approach to his work. And I think, that, you know, the, the, the sacredness to, to what, what he, did and, the, and how it's really conveyed it through his work, whether it is spoken or, or visual. So, um, Chris, uh, well, we, we spent some time with some of the, um, the the friends and people that knew Gavin, but we have um, Chris, who I believe introduced himself as a, a fan of his work. So I wanted to share a couple of his photos that he shared with us. And Chris, did you want to say a couple of words on? Um, Kind of how you first came across Gavin, how you met him, and um, what inspired you to, or how you became a fan? Well, I, I, I don't even remember how I met him, but he used to drop by here all the time, and sometimes with very specific requests, like he came by one day and asked me if I had a banana. And I did, and I shared it with him, and uh, he'd come over and he'd bring me something like this shirt, and... Um, I was very happy to give him all the money in my wallet. And uh, and I was a big fan in that if I heard he was performing, if he was reciting poetry, if he was showing, if he was gonna be somewhere, I would go there and, and follow him. I, he, he, his poetry amazed me, I was just floored. And I was a little surprised at his uh, celebration of life to see just how prolific he was. I, I didn't, I knew he was a painter and I knew he painted, but I didn't know he painted so much. And there are so many of these wonderful pieces, all, you know, that all these people had collections of 30 or 40 or 16 or whatever, you know, and I, I mean, I thought I had a big collection with four or five and, uh, yeah, um, but I, I love hearing the stories because he was very consistent in, in his approach to different people. And I didn't realize probably until later that he, he had kind of picked me to be one of his people. And he, he would stop by regularly, at least like once a month or so. 
and he'd just show up. He'd have either have something for me or want something or or just stop by and say hi. You know, he, he was just uh, yeah. and and he his his somebody mentioned earlier. You know, his life was poetic. He lived his life poetically and artistically and. Uh, when I got the piece that was just up the let's go to Pittsburgh piece, I went to, he was living um, on the second floor of the rug building at the bottom of the avenue uh, and, you know, very much a commercial space. And um, I had asked him if I could buy a piece of art and he said, sure, come on over. And I went in there and at that time there was probably maybe a dozen different pieces that he was working on and uh, that one struck my fancy and I said what is that and he says that's called let's go to Pittsburgh and the the story was he was talking about in the movie Basquiat um, Andy Warhol comes in uh, to Basquiat's wherever he was staying at the time and he was super strung out at the time and and uh, Andy Warhol just looked at him and says, let's go to Pittsburgh. So uh, in the painting, there's the little uh, Morton Salt girl. And that is, um, represents uh, Govin's boyfriend. And then there's another little picture here yeah, of Van Gogh. And that's, of course, Govin. And... Uh, I can't see it because people's uh, pictures are in front of it, but I found a little plastic house and I added it to this painting and I, I knew he wouldn't mind. <laughs> it wasn't in there in the original. It's that little red plastic piece that's the top of one of those buildings that I can't see because your pictures are over it. But um, yeah. So I don't know. Um, I sure miss him. Uh, I'll never forget him. And uh, I have another piece that I haven't shown. That uh, a two-sided piece that was one of those that he just stopped by and gave to me. The other side's just bricks. But I haven't ever really known how to display this because I think it needs to be displayed so that you can see both sides. And there was a, a Van Gogh that I saw in, um, I think it's in the Modern Art Museum or else it's in the Met. And he painted on both sides of the canvas and they have it encased in glass standing up on a podium. So I don't have that to do here, but I'm going to figure that out one day to where I can include this in a more prominent position. Uh, you're muted, David. Sorry. Yeah, so he would just stop by and um, unannounced and you never knew what to expect if you were going to get a work of art or needed to <laughs> um, help him out with something. I didn't really care, you know, yeah, he, he just stopped by. And I guess he did that with a number of people. I was on his rounds, you know, he did that with Michelle Chapin. Um, I'm, I would guess he did it with Steve and Phil and, you know, wherever he could bike to. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I think I think Michelle Chapin said that he'd show up outside the gate singing a song like uh, I don't remember the song but and then and Denise I remember Denise when she was talking about their first meeting and he, he was smoking in the bookstore and she said you can't smoke in here and he said I'm not smoking <laughs> is that correct that's correct that's it I don't know what you're talking about, Miss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a character. Well, thank you. So, Moses, um, did you want to say a little bit about um, your experience with Gavin, how you met him, and how you came across some of his works? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and, and Chris Jensen just mentioned uh, Michelle Chapin. It was sometime in the early to mid 1990s that Michelle Chapin and M.B. Hanrahan 
were painting a mural at the foot of Palm Street. And I just tagged along and helped paint. And um, they had already an agreement with the Turning Point Foundation. And they, um, uh, what they did to get ideas for the mural, they talked first to the people at, at Turning Point. And I, I guess everybody knows Turning Point deals with homeless people. And um, being homeless, um, you know, will make you mental in a very, very short time. And so they were asking people what they wanted in the mural. And somebody said something like, um, well, we should have a horse on on a computer. Um, that was his contribution. That was his idea, this person. And so sure enough, there in that mural, there was a picture of a horse like sitting in, at a desk with his with his legs up about to type on a computer, the old type of uh, tube computers. All right. So I'm just saying that to tell you about, um, you know, the wonderfulness of art and creativity and where ideas come from. And so one day, um, all of these turning point people showed up. And on that day, um, he was known as Warren. And um, the next day he was known as Govin. And from there on, he was known as Govin. And um, I always had a problem trying to distinguish between who were the patients of, or the, or, or the clients of Turning Point and who were the supervisors. <laughs> I didn't know who was who. And at the end of the project, I found out, I thought Galvin was one of the clients, but he was actually hired by Turning Point. And so he was not a client at all. And the guy who I thought was running the program was a client, you know? And so, I mean, that's, that, that's Galvin. And I started following him around town too, in, in, in terms of finding out that he was, he was performing somewhere and uh, his performances was was an education. If you listened, he was telling you. He was teaching. He Always was teaching, different, you know, about the streets. And uh, he knew his music, and uh, he could sing. And um, watching him, he he was a poet, but he was also a performance artist. And watching him, I used to, I would not envy the person who had to come on after Govin, you know, we had some really, really great um, uh, poets in this town. We always have. And there are people, you know, who could and, and had to follow Govin. Um, some very strong poets like, like Jackson Wheeler that was mentioned earlier and Marcia Vella Old, she could follow. Um, uh, Phil Taggart himself, you know, but I would envy no one who had to follow uh, Gavin. He, he's a hard act to follow. And okay, so one, one more little thing. Um, I found out from Denise just, just recently that Gavin, um, he had an interest in studying um, the, the movements of of black, um, you know, like uh, migration from the South. How did they end up in Southern California? How did they end up in Ventura? Who were the blacks here? And uh, that all made sense. You know, I have a couple of pieces. I wish they would have been put in the slideshow, but I, I didn't see them. And one of them was Houston's Cafe uh, here in, uh, here in Ventura. Well, that's what, there it is right there, Houston's Cafe. Uh, that was a black owned business from 1955. And um, it was less than a half a mile away from the Green Mill Ballroom, which was over there by Patagonia at the outskirts of town. And when black artists would come to perform at the, at the Green Mill Ballroom, 
uh, like the Coasters or Don and Dewey or Chuck Berry, you know, they would want to go to a black, a black owned restaurant um, for dinner. And uh, they ended up at Houston's. And so I talked with um, Richard Houston, the, the, the son of the, of the couple that owned uh, Houston's. And um, we agree that, that um, Govan had met Mrs. Houston and talked to her because of his own interest. And, you know, we, uh, MB Hanrahan and myself, we included this, this image in the new Tortilla Flats mural. And so I was, uh, um, that was just, you know, you have something, you have it in your collection for so long, and then you find out a new story about it. And actually, to me, that looks pretty much like um, Chris Jensen, that piece that you were holding up. I don't know if it is, uh, uh, but and nonetheless, um, that's what I'd like to say about Gavin. I mean, I did see him walking down the street dressed as a woman, but, you know, everybody has those stories. Uh, maybe he was Diana Ross that day. Um, but I'm also proud that we had a memorial service for for uh, Gavin at the Bell Arts Factory, too. Yes. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Moses. And the other one, it uh, looks like you have a, um, a chair. In your, how big is that piece? What's the, what are the... Oh, um, I would say it's uh, about four feet tall. Okay. And uh, I'm really, I only have two pieces. I'm really proud of both of them. Um, so proud that I got them on the wall in a way I'd have to destroy the wall to take them off. You know, so that's how much they mean to me. Well, thank you. Um, so we have, you know, a few minutes left and I wanted to see if there were any questions from um, any of the other people here. If you have anything that you wanted to ask any of the presenters or just wanted to throw out there, please, please do so. Um, just go ahead and unmute yourself. You don't need to raise your hand. I was wondering if Mari Bell had some stories. I didn't hear Mari Bell. Well, some of the stories that I have, I wanted to add when uh, Chris was saying how he would just like show up. He normally would show up like on a Friday night, you know, kind of like I can hear him like around maybe like 9.30 or 10. He would be just walking down the hallway. Last month, um, I'm not lying. <laughs> Last month when I did have the, the you know, the the virtual art exhibit. I had a couple friends here wearing a mask. And uh, one of them say, somebody passed by right now. And it was, it was like around 10, 30, 11. After we actually had the, uh, the gallery was closed and everything, somebody actually say, somebody just passed by right now. I can totally feel it that day, especially playing the music. That's what I asked Phil if he asked if he liked Eta, Eta or Eartha Kitt. Yes, and uh, it was just amazing. I can even feel it right now in my skin. You know how he was just present. You know, and and then being when the second show that actually Bell Arts put together, it was actually through. Mari from Vita, from Vita Art Center, when he had the second, he was, he, I had the first one, I asked Josh to have my Sola show, and he was the second one, and I just couldn't find a video that I was actually recording. I record him. I remember Mary came in and said, okay, I'm gonna hang your work, and she goes, and he goes, uh-uh, I'm hanging my own show. <laughs> so he will be like nailing everywhere he wanted. And <laughs> I actually have a somehow, Denise, from the time you guys were organizing, I was able to actually found a piece that I put together uh, with uh, maybe you guys just left it out and I actually put tape in the back and I put it together as a puzzle and I added to my collection Plus another one that I that I bought that day, 
which actually I don't know if you guys know, but we I actually put together the like a photo slideshow before everything started selling. I took photos of everything. So we do have a lot of a lot of photos of his work. And I can totally see those. Some of them I can I remember seeing them in the slideshow that I created. And a lot of those I don't I don't see them. So it was amazing to get to know Gavin. Yeah. I remember one time he did ask me for a, for a blue cup <laughs> to drink some wine, I remember. A and I gave cup. it, I don't know where that blue cup ended up. <laughs> Somebody's, maybe in an apartment or something, but it was, it was really, that's how I remember Gavin. Yeah, I think we should definitely put something together. Uh, here, here, I agree. Yes. I think we should put a, a statue of him where uh, Father Sierra just... I think that's a great <laughs> idea. Uh, Fantastic. Dressed like Diana Ross. Right. <laughs> Somebody actually just posts uh, on, on Facebook a photo dressing up. I don't know, they was asking me if it's Diana Ross, but somebody just posted a photo of him in the street. You guys probably will see it on the Facebook, but it's there. He, he was also a really big fan of Lucy Hicks, who was a black transgender woman in Oxnard. Um, I think it was in the 30s maybe the 20s. He was a big mm. fan of Lucy Hicks, so we could think about her for the statue as well. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yes, real saints. <laughs> this is the door you made, Lynn, have uh, the, the hey, lady. There's, there's a, there's yeah. a <laughs> yeah, it does? Yeah, I thought so. Uh, it's, it's in my house now. It's uh, uh -huh. the door between my kitchen and my living room. Cool, I wonder where that was. Yeah, it's over, it's over here, yeah. If you ever want it back, you can have it back. I want to see it. I want to see it. Yeah, you can come on and see it. Yeah, it's a great door. Cool. Steve, I like your uh, Rembrandt lighting and your modeled background. You look oh, well, very artistic. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just uh, threw it up there. Uh, there, there so, you know, you got like 15 minutes to go. Uh, what are you going to do? And I said, you it know. looks great. I got it. Oh, that one, Denise. There you yeah. are. Well, that, that's what happens when you when you when you got a lucky charm in your pocket. It just ends. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, uh, any other thoughts or uh, questions from from the uh, people in attendance here? Well, I'll be happy to share. Just uh, I'll post some things on the Facebook page, but you know, Gavin had two really incredible reviews in the LA Times in the late 90s and early 2000s. And as I was going through and looking, just like doing some internet surfing to see what was out there, there's an image of that Eartha Kitt painting at the top of the stairwells in the upstairs gallery that's part of the Getty images. I found, just found this today. And I just think it's a tribute to the power of his work. I mean, I had no idea. But they made it from the LA Times to Getty Images, but Dobbins works there. So um, he might not be in the museum or the city's collection, but he's part of the Getty Images. So that's pretty powerful. I'd be, I'm not sure if we have, I, I don't know if anybody wants to touch on it right now, but I'm just kind of interested. It sounds like his role at Turning Point was also important in some ways to his art and made a lot of introductions and was how he, met quite a few people, and I imagine at the same time helped with quite a few people working for that organization. And Gavin moved to Ventura. He came up um, after being homeless on Skid Row. Uh, Susan Tyburn was a sponsor of his and helped him get housing on Santa Clara, probably near your house, Chris. And that's about the time that I met him. It was before he went to work for Turning Point. And it's a tribute to Clyde Reynolds, who was probably helping Gavin initially and saw something in him and decided that he needed to give this man a job. And I know that his work as a case manager with the mentally ill homeless clients at Turning Point 
he really related and he was able to um, really help them. Uh, I, I met him through that referral for a second time after the kind of ill-fated cigarette incident in the bookstore, but he, he had a huge heart and he was really interested in people at their core and wanted to help people. Um, a lot of people didn't see that side of Dobby. Uh, and the, it's um, the very challenging work, um, you know, and I, I think emotionally draining. And I think, you know, we, we see some of the emotion in his art and his poetry. Um, but, you know, I, I think I'd imagine that it was in some ways an outlet for him um, to be working with people with turning point and then um, and then his own life experience. So I, I just really wanted to thank everybody for um, sharing these stories tonight and sharing their artwork and um, helping. I, I think if we can bring something positive um, to continue this message I, I, and to continue bringing Govin's work out to the, not only greater Ventura community, but to the, the art world as a whole, I, I think would be really incredible if we can continue the conversation, as they say. So. Um, unless anybody, is there any other last thoughts or um, what I'd like to do is once we're kind of all done here, Madibel has put together a video that we can just hit play on and we can kind of all exit out on the way out. Um, it's about 10 minutes long, but um, any other final, final thoughts? And well, I have an odd thing. Uh, Mr. Govan was a J.C. Penney's uh, portrait photographer. Really? Yeah. I'll begin. <laughs> he was. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been been saying that now. <laughs> yeah. So now you know where he got all his time. Yeah, he used to take kids' portraits, I believe. Do you have any photos? Of him taking kid portraits? I, I don't know. I don't I don't know. <laughs> if I, have. I don't have any that I know. But uh, yeah. He did that. Uh, he also, uh, well, I don't know if I'm sure he had, uh, he had a white uncle too. Yeah, so he was just a, he, once I found that out, you know, we we had a few words over that. <laughs> <laughs> that was it, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll go back to my little hole. No, <laughs> thank you, Steve. No, thank you very much for being here. Well, thank uh, you. And Denise and Phil and Chris and Moses and everybody else that, that took the time. Uh, I also wanted to really thank Maribel Idiani um, for putting together the exhibit at Bell Arts Factory. If, you, if any of you have not dropped by to see it in person, um, please do. There is a video of it on our Instagram, but it doesn't do it justice. So um, please, please take some time. And um, I'm going to go ahead and close it on out with the video and just share a screen here. And, and um, I believe most of you will have our contact information. If you do need to reach us, just info at bellartsfactory.org. Um, and we look forward to kind of using this as a stepping stone to bringing Gobbin's work out to, to more people there. So thank you everybody. And we will see you all soon. Thank you. Sigue ese rumbo de tantos pintores viejos, aunque la virgen sea blanca, píntame angelitos negros que también se van al cielo. 
todos los negritos buenos pintor si pintas con amor ¿por qué deprecia su color si sabes que en el cielo también los quiere Dios pintar de santos de alcoba si tienes alma en el cuerpo porque al pintar en tus cuadros te olvidaste de los negros siempre que pintas iglesias Pintas angelitos bellos, pero nunca te acordaste de pintar un ángel negro. Pintor, si pintas con amor, ¿por qué deprecia su color? Sabes que en el cielo también los quiere Dios. Pintar de santos de alcoba. Si tienes alma en el cuerpo, porque al pintar tus cuadros te olvidaste de los negros. Siempre que pintas iglesias, pintas angelitos bellos, pero nunca te acordaste de pintar un ángel negro. Just been down, down to Memphis town. That's where the people smile, smile on you all the while. Hospitality, they were good to me. I couldn't spend a dime and had the grandest time. I went out a dancing with the Tennessee deer. They had a fella there named Handy with a band you should hear. And while the dancers gently swayed, all the band boys played real harmony. I never will forget the tune that Handy called the Memphis Blues. They got a fiddler there that always slickens his hair And folks, he sure does pull some bow And when the big bassoon seconds to the trombone's croon And moans just like a sinner on revival day the men 
Memphis blues so grand presentation it was perfect and everybody to bring out those pieces together i'm even crying <laughs> <laughs> it was nice it was really nice it was good to see mr goblin's work uh yes. flashed across the screen i just see the pieces i have so i don't see them all I wanted, I wanted to say that i just think his work will speak to the next generation and it'll be such a gift to be able to help out with that. And his work was so powerful. And for me, he, he, you know, he taught me 
how to be an artist in ways that I didn't learn, you know, by going to school, um, you know, and, and just um, how, he's, how he expressed himself in the world. You know, I think pe people will be inspired for generations to come if we do work on a project like that. Totally. Yeah. All right. Lovely all seeing right. you all. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, it's good seeing you all and participating with you. Thank you. Thank you. Almost doing the job.